okay, just because I know it's kind of a busy day. And we really appreciate y'all coming coming here to uh, hear Sarah give a, give a talk here. Um, so uh, uh, Sarah Hobold is today is here as our speaker. Um, she is a let me see. Uh, a, I think you're a lecturer, right, in comparative European government at the uh, University of Oxford and, and visiting a Jean Monnet fellow, right, at, at, um, at the University of Michigan right now this term. So it was uh, fortuitous that we were able to have her down from Ann Arbor here to give a, a talk. And, um, and so today she's going to be talking about um, um, responsibility attributions and, and how voters think about uh, signing responsibility in sort of a multi-level multi governing space, being the European Union vis-a-vis uh, -vis their national governments. And so without further ado, I'll turn over to Sarah. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tim. And thank you to the Center for West European Studies and to Tim for bringing me up here. It's uh, very exciting for me to, to be here at the university and be in, the, in beautiful uh, Bloomington for the first time. And, and uh, thank you, everyone, for, for coming. So this uh, paper today is really a part of our uh, a uh, larger project that I work on and that I look forward to hearing your input on, which is looking at um, how uh, citizens think about who is responsible for policy decisions or who is in charge when they are dealing with complex institutions such as those that they face in the European Union, and also what consequences does that then have for how they act in, in elections at different levels. So what I'm going to focus on today is the first part of that talk, namely how do they make sense of how to assign responsibility um, in the EU? Can you see those slides? Are they too light? Right? Okay, great. Uh, so this, um, I, I wanted to start with this cartoon, which is the current, for a couple of weeks at least, and former prime ministers of, of the country that I, I live in, namely the United Kingdom normally, and uh, they are sort of debating what to do with the EU and whether to follow these stars in the skies that are meant to symbolize the, the EU flag. And the reason I, I chose this cartoon for the beginning of my talk is I think for most citizens in the EU and maybe also for many of us who uh, study the EU, it's a bit like that. It's sort of far away, quite incomprehensible. Um, but the problem is that of course as the EU has grown in power and has expanded um, its influence and the, the range of policy area that it deals with is not enough anymore for voters to say, oh, it's just something out there that we don't have to deal with. Really, if a voter wants to be engaged and want to be able to make sense of politics and influence politics, they also need to, uh, to know and understand about what the EU is responsible for. And what I try to look at in this paper is, well, to what extent um, do they do that? So the question is, how do voters assign political responsibility in the EU, and on what basis do they form these judgments? So to what extent both um, we know from the literature on attribution of responsibility that, there, that people's individual level predisposition influence uh, their responsibility judgments, so I look at that. But also I look at how the institutional context shapes these attribution judgments both the institutional context at the national level and at the European Union level. So the outline um, of my talk is like that. First, of, I'll sort of try and convince you that studying attribution and responsibility, uh, who is in charge, is important. It's important if we're interested in, in the EU, but even if we're not, it's sort of key concept. And of course, a lot of Professor Helwig's works look at that. It's a key concept if we want to understand democracy uh, more generally, and especially the concept of sort of electoral accountability. And then I'll look at specifically at the EU and looking at the institutional context and look at the individual level context, specifically what I call group serving biases. And uh, then I'll also hope to uh, take this opportunity to, to make a little plug for uh, some data. And in the European election studies where I'm one of the principal investigators and I keep on sort of saying that it's going to be released next week but I think next week will be the week so I hope that for those of you who are interested in political behavior and attitudes and maybe want to look at that in a European context that you'll make use of, of these data uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll return to that and then I'll show some results using these data trying to test other propositions regarding uh, attribution judgments and talk about what the implications are. Okay, so first, um, 
you know, why look at attribution of responsibility in any kind of context? Well, I think the sort of um, the core of this idea is really uh, one of the ideas at the heart of how we think about electoral democracy, namely that one of the key things that elections do is that they provide uh, an opportunity for voters to uh, sanction governments on the basis of how well they've been doing. So if things are going well, then, well, they should be rewarded in elections. And if things are not going so well, they should be punished. So this sort of simple sanctioning model, of course, the assumptions at the heart of that, that's not always spelled out, but the assumption here is that voters can assign responsibility for these policy outcomes, let's say, most commonly we think about it in terms of the economy, but it could be other things as well. So they can assign responsibility, so they know they can say it's this guy's fault or this government's fault, and they can vote uh, accordingly. Now, um, this sort of simple model has been called into question from sort of different perspectives in the literature. Uh, one uh, from an institutional perspective saying, well, this is really conditioned by the institutional context. And from another perspective coming more from political psychology, uh, this has also been the, the assumptions one makes about how voters think about this have also been called into question. So if we start thinking about it from the institutional perspective, there is a large and growing literature looking at how the extent to which there is this neat link between policy evaluations and policy outcome and vote choice is really conditioned by the clarity of responsibility. So it's very easy when you have the kind of system you have in, in, in the United Kingdom, for example, where you have a very almost all-powerful government with control of a parliament and so on, and then we can see, well, it's definitely this Gordon Brown's fault, so probably in a couple of weeks he will be punished accordingly. But what when you have a sort of much more uh, complex system of, of institutions that blur line of responsibility, then this link is not so clear. And that's what we, there's a large literature looking particularly at economic voting, showing that the link between both perceptions of the economy but also actual economic outcomes on the one hand and, uh, and electoral outcomes on the other hand is much weaker when you have complex institutional structures. Now again you can see that the assumption in this, behind this is really that that's because it's hard for voters to assign responsibility when you have complex institutional structures. Again, not much of this literature, although there's a growing literature on it, but not much of this literature explicitly look at these assignment of responsibility. They seem to see that this link here is weaker. So again, what I'm going to do is actually look specifically at assignment of responsibility. Now, we're saying that there's also another, uh, from another perspective, that this sort of sanctioning model has been called into question and that's from the sort of individual level, from the social psychology perspective. And here it's the idea that voters simply take information in about, for example, the economy, and then that leads to a certain behavior that's been questioned. No, I mean, the argument is, is that what people like to do is that they're influenced in various ways uh, by their predispositions, and they try somehow to reconcile that with who they think is responsible. In the political science literature, that has uh, specifically been studied in terms of partisan rationalization. So what happens here is that really we attribute perceived successes to our preferred in-group, to our preferred party, and we have solved that in-group of any failures. And uh, so what happened is, for example, if I'm a strong Democrat supporter, is that I might see that it's not going so well with the economy, but rather than thinking that that is the fault of uh, Obama or a uh, Congress uh, dominated by the Democrats, I'm going to think, well, that's probably some exogenous factors, or it's probably because Bush was in the White House for so long, he messed it up, it takes a while uh, to make it good again. Yeah? So that's a way of thinking, well, it's not really his fault, which means, well, then maybe I shouldn't really punish the Democrats either. So that would also weaken this link. Uh, to the extent that we have these partisan rationalizations. Okay, so I, I am arguing that both of these, um, both of these indivi both the individual level story and the contextual level story is very relevant if we want to understand how voters attribute responsibility in the EU. 
So I'm taking the EU to be an example of a system of multi-level government, uh, such as other uh, federations. And just like I talked about how complex institutions in general can uh, impede democratic accountability, this is also the case with federations, because of course what you have with federations is that you, in a sense, the, the extent to which you have democratic accountability depends on whether or not citizens can assign responsibility correctly across these level of government and act on that in elections. And as the scope and the depth of EU policy making ha has grown, as I was saying, I mean, I'm not saying we should necessarily call the EU as a federation, a federation or federal state, that's really relevant, but it certainly has many traits in common uh, with, with federation, and that means that voters face many of the same challenges as they do in, let's say, United States and Canada and so on. And perhaps even greater challenges. Um, For example, we have very much indeed changing responsibility over time. Those of you who study the EU will know that this is very much an organization, an institution, a polity that's in flux. That's exciting when you study it, but it also makes it a bit harder when you need to decide, in fact, who's responsible uh, for particular policy areas. Also, um, uh, policy competencies tend to be overlapping between national and EU levels. And it's not only the competency structures that change, it's also the institutions that evolve. Um, most particularly, um, the power of the European Parliament has increased, and I think you know, we're very lucky to have a former uh, member of the European Parliament among us. This is exciting, so this is someone who can really talk about you know, democratic uh, representation in, in the <laughs> European Union. But of course, that used to be you know, before you were in that seat, that used to be not maybe that much of an important role when it came to um, policy making the EU, whereas today and in the last sort of decades it's transformed into that the European Parliament plays a really significant role in decision making as a co-legislator. And that of course also gives voters a more direct influence. Despite the increasing powers of the European Parliament, the EU still does not have a particularly distinct identifiable executive or government uh, compared to other federations. It obviously has a dual executive of a council and a, and a commission uh, that it doesn't have a clear a partisan identity that can easily be associated with certain policy programs in contrast to, for example, the federal government in the United States. And that creates challenges for voters. Finally, and this is certainly something that EU has in common with other policies, is that there's blame shifting going on. So governments, national governments, obviously like to take, uh, um, take credit for any policy decisions that might emanate in the EU, but that seems to be, you know, things are going well, though that's obviously something we did, whereas when things are not going so well, there might be some blame shifting. And this is not a government poster. This is, in fact, a poster from the last uh, referendum on the Lisbon Treaty, which was... I don't know if you can say successful, that seems like I have a particular sort of bias in one direction or the other, but it certainly ended up with the Lisbon Treaty being ratified. But there are some people here, uh, the Green, uh, there's some, some, some groups here that didn't think it was such a good idea, and this is sort of an idea of blaming 20 million unemployed people. For those of you who don't know, I, these can't all be Irish. <laughs> Maybe by now there are 20 million unemployed people, EU policies don't work, yeah? If you look strictly at competencies, so sort of, it's not only the EU's responsibility obviously to do job training, but here, when things are not going well, clearly that's the EU. Let's say that there was 20 million new people at jobs, they probably wouldn't have said, you know, EU policies work. So this is just sort of an, sort of an example of that. Okay, so now I'm um, going to... Uh, uh, develop my, uh, my, uh, my propositions about how we can think about how citizens make sense of this. So I've sort of tried to say this is, seems uh, close to impossible to make sense of, of who is responsible in the European Union, uh, but there are nevertheless some patterns to it. So if you think of the EU as a federation, we would expect that citizens make distinctions uh, between levels of government when, in terms of the issues that they handle, and therefore these distinctions should somehow be a reflection of a specific institutional structure. But we also know that citizens use certain heuristics in order to uh, make sense of the political world and when making also responsibility judgment, 
and uh, in particular here I'm going to focus on how group serving attribution bias is a key heuristic, so partisanship is one example of that, a key heuristic that people uh, use when making uh, responsibility judgments. So if we start uh, looking at the institutional structures, um, because the EU is a multi-level system of governance, we would expect institutions both at the EU level and at the national level to influence how, who people think is responsible for a particular policy outcome. And it's very nice here because we get you know, some nice variation. Of course we have variation across issues. The EU is more responsible for certain issues than other issues. But we also have in the EU, in the sense that it's sort of an asymmetric federation, we also have variation across countries in the sense that not all countries have signed up equally to all policy areas. They haven't surrendered sovereignty or whatever you want to call it equally to the federal level in all policy areas. And we would expect that to be reflected in the attribution judgment. In other words, we would expect that in countries where the EU has more uh, responsibility, we would also see uh, citizens attributing more responsibility to the EU level. The most uh, famous or infamous example of these sort of asymmetric forms of of uh, competences is the Eurozone. So uh, I'm sure you've heard about the Eurozone at the moment in terms of uh, whether or not to bail out Greece or just kick them out or kick them in the teeth or bring IMF in to kick them in the teeth or whatever. Uh, but uh, so, so Greece is in the Eurozone. They actually didn't join immediately because they uh, uh, couldn't fulfill the convergence criteria and apparently they couldn't join, uh, fulfill the convergence criteria either with, if, when they joined, which we found out subsequent, subsequently that they sort of changed the books slightly. But anyway, uh, they joined. And um, 11, but 11 countries still remain outside. Three on their own volition. So uh, Denmark and Britain actually has real opt-outs. Uh, Sweden has a de facto opt-out, they just sort of say, oh, we don't really want to join, so they don't, they're not legally, they don't have an opt-out. And the other countries actually have it in their accession treaties that they have to join at some point when they meet the convergence criteria. And that means that these countries are not subjected to the same fiscal guidelines, and most importantly, they're not subjected to the common monetary policy, and they're not a part of the common monetary zone in the EU. There are other examples of such uh, opt-outs. Um, another important one is the Schengen zone, which is the borderless zone in the EU, where UK and Ireland remain outside. And Denmark also has a number of opt-outs that relate, uh, relates to immigration, citizenship, and negotiations on foreign policy and so on. So there is some variation that we can leverage in order to see how the institutional context works. Okay, moving now to national institutions we also find some variation that we would expect uh, to influence how voters assign responsibility. And here I'm particularly going to focus on a concept of the effectiveness of national political institutions. As you would expect, uh, that there is, you know, there is some variation here in terms of um, both specifically how much national institutions, how much responsibility and how much um, how uh, much activity they have in specific policy domains, and there's also um, some overall variation in how much in the quality and effectiveness of national institutions when it comes to uh, regulatory co quality, uh, the rule of law, levels of corruption, and so on. Um, so if we look first at the policy um, specific, we would expect that when you have higher levels of, of government activity, um, then it would be more likely that you think, well, clearly my government, is, my national government is very active in this, so it must be uh, their responsibility. So you would expect that citizens in countries with high levels of government activity would also attribute higher levels of responsibility to the national government. An example that's very salient in U.S. politics is variation in healthcare systems. So there's great variation to the extent to which national governments have uh, uh, EU member states have funded, nationally funded, universal health care se uh, um, sectors that are entirely funded by the government, or whether or not they have more insurance-based systems where the government plays a smaller role. Um, now, secondly, 
But there's also variation in the quality of effectiveness of national institutions. You have national institutions that are well known by citizens to be uh, have very high quality of, you know, in terms of the implementation and effectiveness of implementing policies. And we would expect that if that's the case, if you're living in a country like that, you're more likely to, when you see that things are going well in that particular policy area and policies are being implemented, you're more likely to think, well, that's probably due to uh, this national level of institutions because I have experience with, um, you know, they have a reputation for being highly effective. Whereas if you're in a country, and you'll see later the distribution of this variable, and if you're in a country with lower levels, of quality of national institution and you see an amazingly efficient, let's say, economic policy, you may be more likely to think that's probably not, let's say, the Romanian national institution, I think they're about the lowest, that's probably more likely to be attributed to a higher supranational level of government. Um, okay, so now I'm going to sort of shift the gear and move down a level and say, okay, fine, so we do have these variations at, at at an institutional level, and if voters can, we would hope that voters can make sense to, of that, well, we would hope that that institutional context would be reflected in assignment of responsibility. If we find that's not the case, well then, so that sort of suggests that voters are entirely oblivious to, uh, to these institutional variations. However, we wouldn't necessarily expect that to be the only thing that influences them. As I was saying before, there is a large literature, also a national context, that shows that people's assignments of responsibility are not entirely neutral and influenced by a particular context. We know that people try and reconcile the information they get about the outside world with their predispositions and values. Here in, specific, here in particular, sort of, we belong to certain uh, in-groups, um, not least partisanship, or that seems to have been one of the, the in-groups that's been studied mostly in political science, and we know that that uh, influences the attribution process. I gave you the example of uh, being a Democrat or Obama supporter before. Now, my argument in, in, in this presentation is when you look at the EU, because as I said before, the EU uh, at the federal level doesn't have a particularly distinct partisanship identity. So it's not like you can necessarily say, well, the EU government is clearly conservative or Christian Democrat and so on, because the council consists of you know, a mixture of political uh, groupings and so does the commission. So, but that doesn't mean that we don't have, as citizens, don't orient each, uh, ourselves in terms of in-groups and out-groups. And a very powerful in-group and out-group distinction the literature has shown when it comes to people thinking about EU policies and so on, is this distinction between the attachment to the national level and their attachment to the EU. And my argument is that that could work very similarly to partisanship. So in other words, if I have a very strong attachment to the EU, things are going well, well, must be because the EU did it, so I'm more likely to assign. Equally, if uh, I'm more likely to absolve them of responsibility, if I think, well, the EU fundamentally, this is sort of the project I believe in, this is my in-group, the economy not be, might not be doing well, but that's maybe globalization, that's maybe my national government, and so on. So, um, we would expect that to function in a very similar way to partisanship, and I would argue be stronger in an EU context than partisanship, because the partisanship signals are just not that strong. I mean, one thing I think is very interesting if you look at the evolution of the EU is that partisanship signals might I think they are becoming stronger over time at the EU level, but we're still not quite there. Okay, so that leads to some hypotheses that I've hopefully already covered at the individual level, that citizens are more likely to attribute responsibilities to the EU when conditions are improving, uh, citizens who support the EU, so who belong to that in-group, are less likely when conditions are uh, deteriorating. I'm also testing whether there is a, the, the, the sort of standard partisanship bias is also found because we're obviously looking both at attribution at the national and the EU level. So we'd expect that citizens who identify with the party national government would be less likely to attribute, relatively less likely to attribute responsibility to the EU when conditions are improving 
and more likely when conditions are deteriorating. The context level variables were the ones I, I described to you, namely citizens in country with an opt-out, i.e. citizens, for example, who are not, e.g. citizens who are not in the Eurozone, for example, will attribute relatively less responsibility to the EU in that policy domain. Citizens in countries with higher levels of government activity in a specific policy domain will attribute more responsibility to the government rather than the EU for that. And then uh, the cross-level interaction here that the quality of national institutions, I really expect that to mediate a condition, uh, the extent to which um, policy performance influence attribution, so when things are going well, if I'm in a country with highly effective, high quality institutions, I'm more likely to think attribute responsibility to national governments <coughs> than the EU for those outcomes. Okay, so moving to the data. Uh, I said I was uh, going to sort of do a little plug for the data here, namely uh, that the European election study uh, is this survey, some of you might be familiar with them, they've been running since 1989. This time we got more money from the EU, so I hope it's even better <laughs> than previously. And the nice thing is, uh, the, nice, the good thing over there, the, one of the many wonderful things about the enlargements of the EU that where we used to have not very much to play with. Now we have 27 countries. <laughs> it is not so nice when you have to run the survey, but it's great when you have the data. Uh, 27 countries and we run a, um, a survey of national, um, a nationally representative sample of the population, all 27 countries, and we have over 27,000 uh, observations here. And, um, and what we also have in this data set for for those of you who are interested in it, we have also run uh, surveys of the media, uh, so both newspapers and television, done content analysis of that in the campaigns uh, around European Parliament elections in 27 countries. We have surveys of candidates to European Parliament elections in all 27 countries and content analysis of the manifestos of parties standing in the European Parliament elections across all these countries and context data, so economic data, data on the political systems, electoral systems, and so on. So there's a lot to play with there. Um, the data, I was saying I wasn't going to give you a date, but we say March on the website, and March is running out pretty quickly. <laughs> so, so I'm so, I don't know, when is it running out? Tuesday or is it last day or something? So I really hope that will uh, that would be the case. Um, and that's the website there. Um, what I look at specifically for, for this question is looking at functional attribution of responsibility. So how voters assign responsibility, who they think are responsible for particular tasks. Uh, the question wording uh, is like this. As I was saying, I look at responsibility at two levels, the EU level and the national level. Um, Thinking about the economy, that's one of the, the issue areas uh, I look at. How responsible is the British uh, government for co uh, economic conditions in Britain? And what about the European Union? How responsible is the EU for economic conditions in Britain? And so I ask, we ask about these questions, and we do that across five policy domains. Each, uh, the economy, which is a sort of classic thing that everyone studies when it comes to performance voting. But we also look at other areas, both because it's maybe not just about the economy, but also because we get very interesting variation in the institutional structures. Interest rate, obviously, there should be huge variation in whether or not you assign responsibility for interest rate, depending on whether or not you're in a country in the Eurozone or not. Healthcare, immigration, and climate change are the other areas. Now, uh, Let's just quickly look at some of the data. Uh, this is who is responsible then according to voters, where the dark blue is national, light blue is that they're jointly responsible, the green is it's mostly the EU, and nobody. Uh, we do have a sort of, to the question, we do have a sort of preamble or primer that says you might think no one is responsible for this or neither of these levels of government in the sense that you know, obviously there are other actors that might influence this, although I focus here on the governments. 
And what we see is, it's not surprising that what we find is that healthcare, which is a competency where EU has limited influence, although uh, it does have some impact, is an area where, where most citizens think this is really the, the responsibility of national governments. Uh, climate change here is interesting because really if we look at exclusive competences, the EU has more of a coordinating role, but obviously essentially as an issue, it's very much a cross-border issue where you could argue it's very little will get done unless the EU coordinated. And of course, uh, if you follow these things in, in the media in Europe, you would see that it's very much often discussed in terms of the EU having policy and a coordinating role on that in, in instances such as, for example, when the Copenhagen summit took place. Uh, the economy is uh, is one where, you know, A, it's sort of hard to say who's responsible for the economy. Obviously, the economy is monetary policy, it's fiscal policy, it's a lot of things. But national governments come out on top there. Immigration somewhere in between. And interest rate, uh, we see a split. Interest rate is one where really, this is obviously an average here across all uh, member states. If we look at it by Eurozone and non-Eurozone country, we do find some, quite some variation, maybe not as much as we'd like, but variation nevertheless. Uh, here in non eurozone countries, we find that a majority say this is the national government, um, and in Eurozone countries, we have a majority saying it's the EU or it's jointly. And in a sense, I mean, both are right. If you look at who sits in the monetary policy, the national bankers, and of course, also national governments do have some influence over that, but, uh, but certainly there is some variation there. Okay, so uh, this is just some descriptive data. Now I'm going to try and model this uh, to get uh, to provide better tasks of the propositions I put forward. So the dependent variable, what I do here is because I'm interested in not just attributions to the EU, not just attributions to the uh, national government level, but relative attribution across these multiple level of governance. I look at the EU attribution score minus the national attribution score, which then creates a scale from plus 10 to minus 10, which is a, a nice normal distribution, to test the individual level uh, hypothesis concerning uh, group attribution, uh, group serving biases. Um, I have policy performance evaluation across each of these five policy areas, so they're obviously slightly different for each of them, asking how well uh, policy, you know, the change in policy over the last 12 months. Uh, EU support to test the in-group, um, the in-group to the EU, which is uh, a number of items. So I, 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 this is an additive scale, from 0 to 8 here. Partisanship, which is um, attachment to the national government. I'm happy to in the Q&A if you're interested in particular sort of questions about some of these operationalization. Political knowledge is uh, objective knowledge questions uh, about EU and national politics. Doesn't make much difference. I mean, they're highly correlated, those two, so, so I use all the, the measures I have. And then interactions between those, between the in groups, partisanship in EU, and the policy performance evaluations. To test the um, context level variables, I'll show you a little bit more about each of these because, of course, here the devil is also in the detail, but I have an index of quality of national political institutions, then I have some issue specific context variables. And again, I have a cross-level interaction between the national quality, because I believe that to be conditioning the effect of policy evaluations on, um, the effect of policy evaluations on assignment of responsibility. Now, uh, this model, you'll see, uh, I just control for the size of the economy, uh, it's not significant, but I thought, you know, it, theoretically it makes sense that if you're a larger country, rich, you know, you might attribute more responsibility to your national government. I could put in a hundred other controls, although you might have a degree of freedom problem, but uh, they, they don't come out significant, so I keep it parsimonious, so that's all. But if you have questions about particular controls you think should be in there, you know, please do raise it. Um, I won't, this is a hierarchical linear model, as I said, with 27,000 individuals nested in 27 countries. I won't uh, show you the re actual results here, I'll show you some pictures instead. That's not because I'm lying or hiding things from you. <laughs> That's just because who wants to look at sort of coefficients, but I sent a paper to Professor Halwig, so 
if, I mean, I'm sure you'd be happy, or I would be happy to give it to you if you want to look at the really gritty, but I'll just sort of show you some, some, uh, some of the graphs now. I said I would first say a little bit about the context variables. Uh, for the economy, it's very clear that uh, Eurozone membership is expected to matter. The same thing with interest rate. For immigration, I created a dummy for, for countries that have an opt-out from Schengen or Justice at Home Affairs. Really, that translates into the UK, Ireland, and Denmark. would expect them to attribute less responsibility for immigration. This might be slightly tenuous in the sense that obviously these maybe the link between Schengen and immigration policy is not that clear. Anyway, I say that now because it doesn't work. No. <laughs> <laughs> so it's obviously very tenuous theoretically. Yeah, it's not a good operation. <laughs> uh, if you have better ideas uh, for how I might capture that variation, I welcome it. Healthcare and climate change, there are not really variation in how the national member states have subscribed to the EU level competences. However, there is variation in the activity of the, at the national level, which I operationalized. I mentioned healthcare already. The size of the government-funded uh, healthcare sector would expect that to lead to higher attributions to the government, lower to the EU, relatively. In climate change, I use an indicator for something called national adaptation strategies, which are the countries that have adopted a strategy on how to fight uh, climate change and are more active in that area as a consequence. Quality of national institution, which is my other national context level variable. I use uh, a variable that some of you might be familiar with, the World Bank Governance Indicators. I think it's a, it's a nice data set. Uh, that, uh, I use four of their five, or five of their six indicators, accountability, government effectiveness, regulatory quality, rule of law, control of corruption. These are highly correlated. The fact you get like an alpha of about 0.98. Uh, Sweden, Finland, Denmark. So one end. I'm from Denmark. I don't like the Swedes. I always beat us in any kind of index. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like. Uh, and now even I saw here the European Center. They're teaching Norwegian. Who oh, why Norwegian? Uh, why not like Danish or some of Norwegian <laughs> and Dutch? Uh, and then Romania, Bulgaria down here. And it's interesting, it's not just new member states, old member states. Italy is also here. Greece. Greece. It's a Spaniard here. So, uh, so, so there, it's not just that. I would say also if I control for when countries exceeded or new members, you know, I thought maybe there's a sort of old member state, new member state division in this, which I could find in the data. Okay, now uh, uh, I build up the model, so I started at the individual level, so I'll show you the uh, evidence of these group serving biases first. So, okay, let's say that this is maybe nothing to do with uh, institutions first, it's just uh, which in group people belong to or EU level support. And we do find some support for the first hypothesis, namely that citizens who support the EU are more likely to attribute responsibility to the EU when conditions are improving. We see it here for immigration. So here, this is the marginal effect of uh, this is the marginal effect of performance evaluation in immigration on assign relative assignment of responsibility to the EU. That's all plotted here, and that's by different levels of EU support. What does that mean? That means that uh, for people who are Eurosceptic, we sometimes call them, so have very low levels of in-group attachment to the EU, when things uh, are going better in immigration, they think they actually attribute less responsibility to the EU relative to national governments, whereas people who have high levels of in-group attachment to the EU, they attribute more responsibility to the EU when things are going better along with our hypothesis. Uh, healthcare, similarly, but more precisely estimated, as you can see. Now, the economy and interest rate, again, our hypothesis are confirmed, but as you can see here, that uh, interaction distance travels zero, which means what? That means that always, 
when the economy, when people perceive the economy to be going better, they attribute slightly more responsibility to the EU. But for people who are Eurosceptic, that is a very small effect, and that's a very large effect for people who are supportive of the EU. And the same for interest rate. So that suggests, well, there is certainly that group so uh, in-group serving attribution bias in the EU uh, when it comes to uh, European attachment. Uh, on the other hand, we don't really find it so much for partisanship. I hypothesize that people who feel attached to national government are less likely to attribute responsibility to the EU when citizens are approving so similar things at national level. And we find that in the area of immigration, that's an area, for those of you who study European politics, that's very highly politicized at the European level, uh, sorry, at the national level, perhaps less so at the European level. And maybe that's why we find it in that area. We find a weak, very weak effect in interest rate. But generally, I think the results suggest that when it comes to these groups serving attribution biases, it's really much more about uh, the EU versus the nation uh, than the partisanship. And I think that's because that the partisanship identity identifiability also is just not there when you look at the EU level. Now, the institutional context, I hypothesize that uh, when you are in a country that has an opt-out, you will actually be less responsibility in that policy area. So we see that very clearly with the Eurozone. I already showed you some descriptives. We very clearly see here that countries that are in the Eurozone attribute more responsibility for interest rates and the economy. I think it's nice that the effect is bigger for interest rate because it's clearer here that it matters whether you're in the Eurozone whereas the economy, obviously the different mix of institutions that might have an effect on your economy is much wider. Uh, equally, we also find uh, national institutions to have an effect, a significant effect. Uh, both your national adaptation strategy and climate change lead to more national attribution, less EU attribution. The same with when you have large government-funded healthcare sectors. I told you that already that the Schengen opt-out doesn't work. <laughs> Which is not because of the theory, but because I couldn't find good measures. Okay, now, quality of uh, it's, uh, national institutions, that's my final hypothesis here. Uh, I argue that that has a conditioning effect um, so here we see the national context level where uh, uh, national context really conditioning the way in which we think about uh, uh, the way in which we interpret um, whether when things are going well or when things are going badly, who's responsible for it. So if we know we have highly effective national institutions, they tend to get the job done and we see that things are working well, we would attribute more responsibility to the EU and less responsive, uh, sorry, more responsibility to the national government, less to the EU. In contrast, if we're in Romania or Greece, and we see all of a sudden things are going beautifully with the economy, we might think that might be because the EU did something there, not because of our national government. And we do find that interaction. So we see here, um, these figures are similar before, as before. If we think about the y-axis, and the y-axis what we have is the marginal effect of performance evaluation on assignment of responsibility in the respective areas. But now what we have on the x-axis is the quality of national institutions. And what we find that, country, that in countries with, the very, with very low quality here, then when they think things are going better, it has a very high effect, positive effect on their assignment of responsibility to the EU and a very small effect in countries with low quality. In climate change, we see that it straddles zero here, which means actually in countries with high quality national institutions, when things are going better in climate change, they attribute less responsibility to the EU. Healthcare and immigration, again, it straddles zero, although you can see now it's not really significant at one end. So what we find that really the effect of improving institutions only has an effect on EU attribution in countries that are at the lower end of the national quality institutional scale. Okay, so that was quite a lot, so let me just sort of <laughs> summarize. Uh, first of all, I think the sort of main message of this paper is really, uh, and I think that's a good thing, 
that in institutional context, however confusing it might be, actually does seem to matter when, when it comes to uh, how voters assign responsibility in the EU. We find significant variation in attribution of responsibility across policy areas and across individual member states. Uh, citizens in Eurozone countries think differ differently than citizens outside the Eurozone. Equally, national political institutions also matter, both in terms of their activity in individual areas, but also in the, the quality of national political institutions also shape how voters translate the information they get about how well things are going in a policy area into how they think about assignment or responsibility for that, those policy areas. That doesn't mean, of course, that voters just sort of uh, objectively reflect on, uh, on the information they get about institutions and policy outcome. They are also influenced by groups of biases. And here the contribution of this paper is really in terms of that we should think in a wider sense about group serving at, uh, attribution biases. We shouldn't just think about it as partisanship, as uh, has often been done in, in, for example, the US literature. That doesn't translate so well into the EU. That makes perfect sense because the EU is not clear which party, so to speak, is in charge. And when that's the case, then voters use other sort of in-group, out-group distinctions in order to make sense of this and reconcile their values with who they think is responsible. And in the EU, that key in-group, out-group distinction is really the attachment to the European Union level. Okay, so um, what are the implications of this? On the one hand, you can say, well, the implications if we think about the sort of the slide I had with all these challenges that citizens face with the changing institutions, the changing and overlapping competences, and the lack of government, and so on, and those of you who study the EU, you know, trying to figure out who does what, it's sort of certainly not easy. The fact that you really see that institutions do shape, uh, com um, do shape assign uh, assignment or responsibility, you could say it's a very good thing uh, when we think about democracy in the European Union. <laughs> Of course, attitudes uh, towards the EU also matter. Citizens do rely on these things as a heuristic. I think normatively, although heuristics, I mean, a lot of has been written about how wonderful it is that citizens rely on heuristics when they make sense of policies. In this sense, if we think about it normatively, this is not necessarily such a good idea, a good thing, because what does it really mean? It means that if I don't like the European Union, I just think that everything that's bad is the European Union's fault, so put it in a nutshell. Why is that a problem? Well, that's a problem because let's say it really is the fault of my national government. I'm going to solve that government responsibility and therefore that weakens democratic accountability. Not just the EU, a lot has been written about the democratic deficit at the EU level, but it also weakens democracy and democratic accountability at the national level. So I would argue that these sort of heuristics are not necessarily that useful if we think about sort of more, more theoretically about democratic, uh, democratic accountability. Now, there might be ways, again, if we sort of try, I try and go out on a limb here and think more normatively about it, that we can. Uh, that the institutional context here might help to, to make it easier for citizens to make sense of this and therefore need to rely less on these attribution biases. I don't think it's been particularly helpful that institutions are flux the way they are, that policy competences are so poorly defined and overlapping, and perhaps particularly that there's no clear EU level of government, and maybe also the problem that there's no partisan level of partisan profile at the EU level, there might be several advantages to that, but it also makes it very hard to identify particular policy outcomes with a particular partisan <coughs> profile. Why might that be a problem? I mean, I think that strengthens the, this use of this heuristic up here, because, um, and I'm sort of, now I'm really in the speculative part, so please forgive me. Because let's say uh, you are unhappy with you an American, you're unhappy with something with the administration. You might say, let's say you were unhappy with the Bush administration. Uh, that doesn't lead you to think, God, the, you know, I didn't like Bush much. The, the uh, uh, U.S. presidency is clearly, you know, a problem. It's a sort of clearly uh, just uh, 
deficient in all sorts of ways because you can associate it with a certain party, you can have a change of government, you can have a sort of fresh start. Yeah? In the EU, because we have no change of government, of course we do, but not one that people can identify, there is never a fresh start. So if you're unhappy with something, and of course there are many reasons to be unhappy with things also in the European Union, that becomes to a lack of regime support as opposed to a lack of, of support for a particular government. And I think that then can lead to a very strong, this sort of ingrubat to do with the NATO, to do with the sort of EU versus NATO. So it means that if we sort of think about Eastern, it's sort of diffuse support that lack, that's lacking in the EU, because you can never attach the blame to a particular government, to a particular party. You have to just think, well, then the EU is obviously run. There's a lot of that in the UK. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, so that leads to a lot of further questions, which I don't have so many answers to. Um, uh, maybe some tentative one. One is that the next link is, the next sort of uh, part of this project is that I look at, you know, what are the consequences for this. I argued in the beginning that this is important for electoral accountability, but as you've noticed, I didn't study electoral accountability in this paper, but that's, that's one step. Uh, another is the question of, are there sort of institutional fixes you can to make the attribution judgment of, in terms of, of thinking about attribution in the EU, and particularly perhaps can, or is it even desirable to establish sort of ideological or partisan attachments at the EU level? And that's what I just tried to address. So, so that's all. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much.